Zoe Kazan, uh, you co-wrote and executive produced the film Wildlife, um, and you also appear in The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, uh, both of which opened this fall. Uh, well, first off with Wildlife, uh, uh, which is based on uh, a novel by Richard Ford, uh, what made you and, and Paul Dano want to adapt that uh, you know, into a movie from the book? Yeah, Paul fell in love with the book, um, which is by Richard Ford. And um, I think he felt like a very strong autobiographical connection to it. Uh, and gave it to me and was like, do you think that this would make a good movie? And I could really see him in it. I could see his artistic sensibility. It seemed like a perfect fit. Um, but it wasn't until um, I started working on it that I really saw myself in it too. Like, um, I think the character of Jeanette is really um, a mystery in the book and because the whole book is told through the perspective of the child. Um, so, you know, it, it's not a, an obvious point of self-identification, but the more I worked on it, the more I felt like, oh, there, but for the grace of God, go I. Like if I had been born in the 1930s and found myself as a woman in my 30s in the 1960s, I think I would have the same kind of struggles. And, and what was that, that experience like uh, collaborating on that script uh, with Paul Dano? You, you wrote Ruby Sparks previously, but that was a, a solo writing credit. Yeah, I had never adapted with, uh, anything before and I had never worked with someone before um, it was really easy once we got started um, you know it was sort of it sort of happened by accident Paul did a first draft and gave it to me and um, I thought it needed a lot of work and then we like fought as I was giving him notes on it and um, basically we just sort of came to the conclusion that it would be easier and faster if I did a pass rather than like trying to explain to him what I thought the work was that needed to be done. Um, but after that initial conversation, it was a really easy, lovely, collaborative process. He's um, got such a beautiful mind. Um, he really thinks like a director, like he has pictures that come to him so clearly. And a lot of my first work on it was really just helping him translate those pictures to the page. Um, to know how to to have those conversations. Um, it sort of reminded me later when we were um, in pre-production, like he didn't know how to talk to Akeem McKenzie, our production designer, about like window treatments. Like he would be like, is the fabric, like, I don't know, but the fabric should feel like sushi. You know, like he didn't have like the right vocabulary. And then like watching him learn how to talk about fabric was like very cool as someone who's been partnered with him for over a decade. And I think the writing process was a little bit that way where like I, I learned, I watched him learn how to think like a writer rather than just like a director. And you mentioned uh, being able to to relate to uh, uh, the, the character of Jeanette uh, who, who became a mother at a young age and is trying Trying to figure herself out, she she's a bit of the mystery in the film too. Even though we get to, you know, she she's fleshed out, of course, by by Carrie Mulligan. Uh, what was it like approaching that character who who has all these complexities and a lot happening under the surface that she doesn't always express and sometimes isn't even able to express to herself? Huh. Um. Well, I think one thing that was important to Paul was that he really felt like the space between the lines was as vital as what the characters were actually saying. The script that we wrote is very spare. There isn't a lot of description in it, but um, we tried to build in room for performance and for the camera to just like linger in silence on people's faces or on um, a moment between people. Um, there's like a lot of space in the script um, by design. And I think that part of that was that these people aren't like very good at talking about their feelings or what's going on with them. And they're acting out in ways to try to like find a form of self-expression, um, but they don't have very good tools to do that. So they're sort of acting out in ways that are maybe not appropriate or um, don't seem moral to us or something like that. And then, you know, we just got very lucky to have an actor like Carrie in that role. Um, you know, she is, such a nuanced, precise actor. And she brought so much care to Jeanette. Um, I think it's really a, like a extraordinary performance and we were just lucky to be able to capture it. And did you have uh, actors in mind when, when you were writing uh, uh, the script, you know, especially those two, you know, parents, uh, uh, you know, Jake Gyllenhaal and Carrie Mulligan? 
We didn't. Um, you know, I think uh, we like the, they're so mysterious in the book. These two parents. We're looking at them from the point of view of the child, and I think for us, it was really about like how do we get to know these people, but still allow them to remain mysterious. Like, the, in order to tell the story the way that Richard Ford envisioned it, like it needs to stay through Joe, the child's perspective. Um, so like, how do we shed light without showing all of a person or like reducing it down, like taking the mystery away? Um, so I think envisioning actors would have been like a kind of way of being reductive about the process. Um, but we were really excited once we got to that phase to start to like imagine people in these roles. And I think one thing that Kate and Carrie bring that's really special is that I think they're both like, like, Carrie's a very feminine woman and like Jake is a very traditionally masculine theming man, but they both carry the opposite with them too. Like there's real masculinity in Carrie, there's real femininity in Jake and they're not afraid to let those other colors show. And because part of what we were writing about is that these people in the 1960s were really struggling with the archetypes that were assigned to them based on their gender it seemed really vital to us that you could see flashes of the opposite in these people. And, and of course, uh, yeah, their, their son in the, uh, in the film, uh, uh, played by Ed Oxenbold, uh, that, that's such an important character, such a central role. Um, you know, what was it like, you know, the experience of casting that character and finding this, this young actor who is, is really uh, has to do a lot with, uh, you know, as you said, a lot that's uh, in between the lines. Yeah. Well, Ed was like a bolt out of the blue and was so exciting for us when his tape came in. He's a young Australian actor. Um, he was one of the last actors we saw for that part. And we had an amazing casting director in New York, Laura Rosenthal, who brought us some really talented kids, but we hadn't seen anybody that felt like exactly what we were looking for yet. And when we saw Ed's tape, it was just such a relief because like I was saying earlier, like so much of the movie does play in silence. So much of it does play in his reactions. You really have to see the cost of what's happening on his face without him doing very much. And like in the in the very first audition tape he sent us, you could see all of that. You could see him thinking between the lines. You could see things landing on him. Like he's one of these actors that really doesn't have to do anything and you can see his inner life. Um, and you know, I don't think we would have been able to make this movie without Ed. He's, he's a really, really special actor. And I, I can't wait to see what he does. He's 17 now and he's like growing up. And um, I think he's going to have a really long career. And Ed, you've had, uh, you know, experiences uh, writing, uh, you know, have, have you ever considered uh, going behind the camera as a director? Is that something that you'd, you'd like to uh, pursue next? Or, or, or is that, you know, something that's not of interest to you? Oh gosh, um, I feel like uh, I have enough hats that I'm wearing right now. Um, but yeah, no, directing is interesting to me. I, I would be interested with the right project. I think one of the things I learned watching Paul do this, and you know, I helped executive produce this, and and also Ruby Sparks, and so I've gotten to watch a couple films come to fruition. And like, it has to be everything to you as the director. It just takes too much work for it not to be. So I'm just waiting for that right thing. And what, what do you hope well, when uh, when people walk out of wildlife, what do you hope they most take take away from it? Oh my gosh. Um, well, we've had some very beautiful responses from people who have said that it reminds them of their own families and, um, you know, particularly children who have gone through the divorce of their parents. You know, um, that really means a lot to me because it makes me feel like we got something right. Um, you know, I, I think, it's a real emotional journey. It's a very quiet film. You know, you have to really like turn off your phone and be present with it. Um, but uh, I think it um, really, I, I, I think for some people it has been a, a film that gives them a lot too. And you know, that's what you're hoping for when you make something like this, you're hoping that it speaks to someone's heart. And uh, you know your your other film out this fall, uh, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, um, is is an unconventional kind of movie, even you know an unconventional kind of Coen Brothers movie and their unconventional 
on 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 a normal day mm -hmm. um you know this is told in sort of vignettes uh, how did you come to be involved in that what what interested you in, in, in this I had for it um you know uh and uh you know obviously what what interested me at the start was the coen brothers they're um the kind of filmmakers that you wait your whole life to be able to work with um and i you know left at the chance i would have left at the chance if it was one line um, but this is a really special part, Alice Longabo. She's um, just a very interesting kind of woman that you don't get to see on screen a lot. Um, it's the kind of part that I've gotten to play on stage more. Um, and I just loved her. I loved getting to play her and I felt so protective of her. She's a very vulnerable person. She's in a very vulnerable position. And um, when we meet her in the movie, and I just wanted to be the person who protected her and represented her. And and this being a, a film in in you know different segments, different uh, shorter storylines. Uh, what was it like developing this character over this kind of this basically a short film? Yeah. Um, well, it's a long short film. My section. Um, my section is the longest in the movie. Um, so in some ways, it's of a piece size-wise with, you know, juicy supporting parts that I've played in other things. You know, I actually had more to do than I've had to do in some feature length films. Um, you know, I never thought of it as a short, really. I, there's a ton of character development and, you know, my, my section in particular is very dialogue heavy. It's much, it was much, much more like doing a play than it was like doing some of the movies that I've done. You know, um, you don't get to talk that much on film that often and definitely not with words that good. Um, so, you know, it, it was just about meeting the material where where lay on the page, you know, what it required from, from me. And, uh, um how much did you know about the the other segments of the film? Did you, were you able to see the whole script with the you know all the storylines laid out, or or did you get to see them later uh, when the film was completed? Um, I never saw. I read all of the other sections before we started shooting, um, and I had one day of overlap in Santa Fe with uh, the cast of the Meal Ticket, so I had dinner with Harry Melling, who plays the actor who is without arms and legs. Um, but I didn't see all of them until I saw it, um, like finished products in in August or September. Um, so that was really exciting for me. What was it like to to see how you know your piece uh, kind of uh, you know because the stories are not connected you know plot wise, but you know how did it feel to kind of watch them all kind of connected uh, stylistically, uh, emotionally? Yeah, it was so interesting. I mean, I think it's a fascinating film. And, um, you know, like I said, you wait your whole career to be able to work with people like the Coens, partially like because I love their movies so much. So I was really excited to be watching the movie. And also because I'm only in part of it, I feel like there I had like some ability to enjoy the rest of it. Like it's very hard to watch your own work. Um, but, you know, I knew for, you know, five sixths of it that I could watch with impunity and, and not worry about, you know, my little face popping up on screen anytime. Um, I don't know. I, I just love the film. I find it really interesting. I've, I've watched it several times now. I learn something every time I watch it. Um, I think it's extraordinarily beautiful. I, you know, I think it's fantastic that Netflix is br bringing it on streaming so that um, people can see it right away. Like I have a lot of relatives who live in places where they're, is not an art house cinema that's going to play this movie. And so like, the fact that they get to watch it next week is fantastic. But I would say like, if you do live in a city where it's playing, try to watch it on a big screen because the film itself is so gorgeous and it's shot in the most beautiful places in America, you know, like Telluride and Western Nebraska, which is where our part was shot. You know, I'd never been to that part of the world before. And, um, you know, I know that it's a part of the world that not, um, you know, uh, not everyone would feel totally comfortable in. You know, I think um, 
uh, you know, being a white girl in Nebraska is probably very different than being a person of color in Nebraska. Um, but it's a, a you know, we were shooting on these like 40,000 acre cattle ranches with no one in sight and these like giant skies and it's not a part of the world I've been to before. So I, I don't know, getting to like see that huge, projected huge, I think is a, a special treat. And you mentioned uh, Netflix, uh, ha you know, having, you know, these different streaming options, uh, on-demand options, in addition to theatrical, um, you know, you get to see different things like Buster Scruggs, which is an anthology film or, you know, different other styles, different other formats, uh, you know, as an actor, uh, a writer, uh, you know, a producer, you know, you've worn all these hats. Uh, does that feel exciting for like future possibilities of, of, of work that you could do or places that you could potentially get it seen? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, Netflix is employing a lot of my friends. So um, I, I, you know, my hat is off to them. I'm, I'm very glad that they're investing in so many different kinds of talent. Um, you know, yeah, it seems like a really vital, uh, interesting permutation in, in the distribution model. Um, I hope that movie theaters never die. I think that communal experience is really important. And like I said, when you have a movie this beautiful, you really want to see it big. Like, I really want to see Roma big, you know? Um, but the fact it remains that, like, it, that, that it belongs to a very elite group who can A, afford to go out to the theater and B, live close enough to, like, in most cases, an art house cinema that's going to play some of these movies. So I'm glad for that. And I'm also glad that there's a, you know, kind of efflorescence of form that's happening on these streaming services. You know, the fact that you have something like The Haunting of Hill House, which is like, in some ways, like a very long film more than it is like a television series. Like, that's really interesting. Um, and I, I also love, you know, I, I feel like Netflix has made the documentary a much more popular form, which is exciting. Well, uh, yeah, congratulations on both uh, Wildlife and uh, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, um, which are, are both out and, and Ballad of, literally, if you have like, you know, see it on the big screen, but if you have a, like a phone or a tablet or something, you can see Ballad right away. Um, uh, so, so thank you very much and, and, and congratulations again. Thanks so much, Daniel. Take care.